Assalamualaikum and welcome to our special show where we have a guest with us today who's flown all the way from Toronto to the UK, Sayyid Mohammed Rizvi of the Jaffrey Islamic Centre in Toronto and we're honoured to have him here in our studio where we're going to be discussing the issue of Khoms and uh, Sayyid Rizvi has uh, written a number of books or a book that has gone through a number of developments about this subject and inshallah he'll be helping us to understand Khoms in a more comprehensive manner uh, so that, inshallah, we don't make mistakes in the way that we pay it. So, Asalaamu Alaikum and welcome. Alaikum Asalaam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for giving us your time uh, in the middle of a busy schedule. Um, you've written um, a book or, which is actually available online, because I found it online, um, about Khoms. And um, I notice it's very technical. It, go, it goes into quite a lot of technicalities, I suppose, for... for, for Perhaps if someone was in banking or finance, it might be easy for them. Someone like me is a little bit more complex. But it's, it, it's, um, it shows how concise Homs is, you know, how, how concisely it, it's, it's worked out. Um, I wanted to just begin the discussion with reference to your book because um, you started off, um, at least the edition that I saw, talking about um, the economic system of the world that we're living in today. Yes. Um, and that, as we know, we're living in a predominantly capitalist system um, which depends on RIBA. And um, I wanted to ask, because, I mean, Muslims know that RIBA is prohibited, but sometimes we don't exactly understand why. How, how is it that, from, first of all, why is RIBA prohibited and how does it enrich some people and, and impoverish other people? Well, as far as the, the issue with riba is concerned, uh, we'll just use the simple term interest. Uh, <clears throat> from the Islamic perspective, of course, Quran is very clear about it. It has been forbidden. And those who would like to portray riba as a normal business activity, a transaction between two individuals, uh, Quran uses a very strong term that it's there uh, their minds are confused because of the touch of the shaitan, wow. which, is, which is very rare to see in, in Quran, these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, expressions. And basically it has to do with the issue that somebody who has uh, excess money is going to use it um, in order to exploit uh, the situation of somebody else. Uh, and, and that's where Islam says, you know, making money out of money under that uh, context is not uh, valid. Yeah. Uh, it has to be that the money has to be circulated uh, in the market uh, as far as what we consider to be normal trade or business. Mm. And that's how the wealth has to be generated. <coughs> And, of course, there's always uh, this debate among Muslim economists, whether they are saying this riba was just um, a different kind of riba during the days of the Prophet, right. and what is now prevalent through the banks. Um, but the majority of Muslim scholars, at least in the Shi'i fiqh, uh, consider even the modern st style of uh, interest to be a riba. Okay. Uh, although other, uh, as I said, some of the Muslim economists try to differentiate between usury and interest. Right, okay. They say that uh, what was forbidden during the early days in Islam was when an individual who is poor or has difficulty financially uh, has to go and borrow money from somebody for a personal you know, uh, need and their asking for extra would be unjust. But if somebody has a business, wants to invest, and that's where they ask for loan, uh, they are saying that's not riba, that would be okay. This is how they want to justify that. Mm. But I have yet to see any prominent scholar among the Shia Fuqaha who would agree with this differentiation. They say even the way it's done now, whether it is for personal consumption or for investment purpose, in both cases it would be haram. Okay, thank you. Um, 
and so <coughs> it tends to it tends to um, concentrate the wealth among the few. And we can see, you know, now at a time in in our history when um, poverty should have been eradicated, that actually it's on the increase even in the so-called first world countries. And in your book, you said that. Um, Communism was invented as a as a kind of a counterbalance to the capitalist system, and even now we can see that communist countries have gone over to to, to capitalism. And you said that Islam actually provides a balance between these two extremes. Yes. Um, again, how how does Islam do that? Find this balance. Well, the, the way we look at it, because capitalism in its uh, purest form would be totally giving to the greed of the person. There is no room for compassion. Yeah. Where poverty is considered to be the problem of the poor person. They are poor because they are lazy. This is right. how this put it. Um, and so, you know, that's one extreme where greed is the principle. Um, on the other extreme, when we look at communist system, uh, where personal ownership of things is completely denied, state becomes owner of everything. Yeah. Islam is right there in the middle, that people are allowed as the agents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to exploit the natural resources of this earth which has been created for them, and God has given the intelligence and the ability to acquire knowledge to exploit the nature for our, our use. Uh, but with that permission of using the natural resources comes a burden. Where God says, you are my custodian. You use it for yourself, but remember, I have some dependents who are the poor ones. Yeah. So you become my trustee in taking care of them also. So it's, it's a balance of, you know, uh, you are allowed to exploit the nature, make money for yourself, but do not forget the less fortunate yeah. members of the society. So this would be um, where zakat and khums would, would come in? Yes, this, this whole idea of sharing what God has given to us with the less fortunate members of the, of the society uh, on two different levels, you know, one is voluntary level on a personal level and one is on a social level. Uh, and so zakat and khums uh, would be the mandatory kind of tax that we have to give in order to uh, help the society in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have what, we, what is known as sadaqa, you know, voluntary charity. And that also has been greatly emphasized in the Quran. Uh, actually, Quran talks more about sadaqah than the obligatory ones because those you just mention it once and then that's yeah. it. But when it comes to the voluntary charity, that's where the emphasis is again and again. That remember that you have to take care of those who are the poor, the needy, the orphans, mm -hmm. and the list goes on. Also, it was interesting to see that, um, I mean, again, just to think about you know, with regard to Islam, the, you know, what is Islam all about? So it's very interesting to see that economic justice um, is a very important part of Islam. And Imam Ali salam, when he became the caliph, um, he immediately, in fact, one of the first things he did was to redistribute the wealth, the wealth that had been wrongly appropriated or wrongly given away. Mm. Um, he, he actually brought that back and, and redistributed it and, and gave the poor from, from the Beit al-Man. Um, um, and there's even a narration here that's saying how, um, you know, he, he ensured that the non-Muslims as well yes. received, received this. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to study the, the early history of Islam where we see that the Prophet came as a, as a messenger of God for all people. He didn't differentiate between Arabs and non-Arabs, you know, Quraysh and non-Quraysh yeah. and others in the distribution of Bayt al-Mal. Um, and when Amir al-Mu'minin comes to power, one of the things he, he had seen in the previous administration was uh, wrong distribution or accumulation of wealth in the family mm. of, of the tribe of the Caliph. And that's where, uh, that's why the rebellion was there yeah. against this third Khilafat. 
And one of the first things that Amir al-Mu'mineen did, and I would call it, this was the mandate of his government, to bring back the balance yeah. uh, as far as uh, social justice, economic justice is concerned. And that covered all citizens of the Islamic State, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. If you look at the list of recipients of zakat in surah number nine, you will see that it also talks about mu'allifatul qulub, means those whose hearts are in a way open to Islam. Right. So they are not Muslims, yeah. but even they are eligible for that. Especially if it's a non-Muslim who is under the Muslim state, it is the responsibility of the Muslim state to take care of that person. And that's where the story is there in the book about Ali salam going into the market and he saw a, a person begging and he says, mm. what is this? And his officers tried to, uh, in a way, uh, run away from the responsibility and they said, well, huwa nasraniyun, he's a Christian. As if, you know, that will be yeah. a good excuse. And that's where Ali says, no. You know, when he was young and capable of contributing to the economy, you know, he was good for you. Now that he's become old and blind, cannot work, uh, you just abandon him, mm. you know, put his name in the list of those who, re, uh, you know, receive from Baytul Mal, from yeah. the public uh, revenue. And so Islam uh, basically has the responsibility of taking care of all its citizens, whether they were Muslims or non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. Uh, quite a different situation as well from what we see going on in Syria today with Christians being killed or Egypt now they're being killed or, or you know. Well, yes, that's, that's very sad, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised when they're killing their own fellow Muslims. Yeah, <laughs> You know, True. that's, uh, it's, it's really a sad story because it seems even worth of a human life uh, is not there in the yeah. eyes of those people who are calling them themselves Salafis, yeah. unfortunately. And looking at uh, again uh, one of the one of the aims of Islam, um, and this is something again that often gets overlooked, um, especially again the, the 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 social welfare aspect is that it was meant to relieve um, poverty. So Imam Ali alayhi salam um, refused to eat um, fine food because, um, you know, he said, as long as there's someone under my rulership who doesn't have access to this food, I'm not going to eat it. Um, with regard to, to the Khums, how does, how does that relieve the, the people living under Islamic rulership from, from poverty? Well, I think we have to look at the overall picture where uh, zakat also plays a very important role. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have also uh, Khums. And uh, our discussion is basically about Khums. Yeah. And the reason why we are talking about more about it, because it has more, uh, you know, it's more applicable to our people. Uh, whoever is earning any kind of income, you know, they would be under that ruling of Khums. Right. Uh, whereas zakat is restricted in Shia fiqh in s only certain areas of economic development. Right. You know, either farming or keeping animals uh, or having gold and silver coins, which is not that common. Yeah. But that is also an important element. So, and one part of it is khums. And, and khums basically is that it's not tax, tax on the income. It is actually taxed on the surplus. Okay. So Islam would, uh, according to the, uh, the fiqh that we have, uh, whatever you earn and spend on yourself and your dependents, that's okay. Mm. But whatever you save at the end, that's where you have to pay 20% of that, which is one-fifth, wow. uh, known as khums. Mm -hmm. And that is one way of, you know, uh, of course, that is mandatory way of yeah. sharing what God has given to you. And it doesn't say whatever is left, you give away. No, at least one-fifth of that mm. uh, surplus or the saving that you have at the end of the year, you have to give it away uh, according to a certain, you know, uh, system mm -hmm. of distribution. 
inshallah hopefully we can we will have time to to talk about that um system of of distribution as well because that that's very uh, important um and and as you said as well that islam aims to eliminate need people in need um and um to alleviate people so that they're, that they're, they're not in in a state of want um and uh, going back to how Homs came about, um, it was interesting that you mentioned that actually, I mean, obviously we know it's stipulated in Holy Quran, uh, you have a narration um, with regard to Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Mm. Could you elaborate on, on that? Well, th the reason why I have quoted that part in the book about the history of Homs because of the difference between the uh, perspectives of Shia fiqh and Sunni fiqh. Normally what we hear from our Muslim brothers who are not part of the uh, fiqh of Ahlul Bayt is that Homs is only applicable in uh, Ghanima which they say is spoils of war. Mm -hmm. Not in any other situation. Right. And the reason why I brought this incident, which is before Islam, uh, in the life of the grandfather of the Prophet, uh, is to show that the first incident in our written history about paying one-fifth is from the discovery of the treasure by uh, the grandson of the Prophet in the uh, Zamzam well, which mm -hmm. was um, hidden and it was rediscovered by him and he saw there is treasure in there from Banu Ismail of the early days in Mecca and he gave one-fifth away and that tradition seems to have been carried on and Islam is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way liked it yeah. and it became part of this verse in Surah Anfal, Surah number 8 of the um, Quran and so the point, my, the point of that story was that the first khums was paid from the treasure, not from the spoils right, of war. Right. So to uh, limit this concept of khums or khumus mm. to spoils of war really is not the right way mm -hmm. of looking at it. And uh, which, again, we don't have time to go, to, to go into today, but um, to recommend people if they want to, to learn more. You've gone into a lot of detail um, about the etymology of, yes. of, of the terms as well to demonstrate that Homs doesn't just refer to um, the spoils of war. Um, and, uh, and as we can see, it means one-fifth um, of, of, of what has been um, acquired yes. um, uh, and, and this was something that you've highlighted um, as well this well which which is in Holy Quran um, as you say chapter 8 verse 41 know that whatever of a thing you acquire a fifth of it is for Allah for the messenger for the near relative and the orphans and the needy and the wayfarer and so you have you have explained in detail again this this term acquire in yes, the features yes. in this, this ayah could you explain a little bit more about that? Well, uh, because we have to look at the, uh, the tafsir of this ayat in the light of the uh, hadith of the Prophet uh, as narrated to us by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And when we look at it, we see there are seven categories uh, where the what is acquired would be explained. Uh, of course, the first one would be uh, whatever profit you have in your business or the savings that you make at the end of the year mm. after you know your expenses. Uh, the second would be um, where you have a wealth which is mixed with halal and haram and you don't have ability to distinguish which one is what or if it is who is the actual owner of that. Yeah. So how do you handle that? People sometimes, you know, they go through different phases in life. They might be into things which were haram. Yeah. Then they realize in the circle, I made a mistake. Now, how do I purify my, my wealth? And this is where the issue comes up. Of course, if you know there is an item or an amount of money which is not yours mm. or acquired by uh, in unlawful means, 
and you know who is the owner, then there is no escape through homes. You have to go and give it back to the right. rightful owner. But if you don't know, and everything is mixed up, one way would be that out of that total, you take out homes. So that is the second category. Then we have other, you know, examples which are more restrictive in a sense, you know, if you are into mines and min minerals, or if you, your profession is to acquire pearls by diving in the sea, uh, and things like that, uh, that's where homes would be applicable. Right. Uh, in the book, and normally when we look at the, uh, the rulings in the books of uh, fiqh, they mostly concentrate on the first one, which is the most common applicable case for mm, members of our community. Uh, and the second also would be to, s to some extent. Other examples, they wouldn't talk about it, whether it's the spoils of war or yeah. uh, a dhimmi buying a la land in a Muslim state. Oh, these, yeah. were, these are not that much relevant, mm -hmm. especially for us who are in the western part of yeah, the world. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and so the focus of uh, the book or even the discussions is mostly on those areas which are more common and applicable to mm -hmm. us. Thank you. Um, and so, yes, you've uh, the, you said that um, you've got these, the, these categories um, here. Um, and moving on to, to the calculation, as you said, it mm -hmm. it's, um, should be on the, on the surplus. If someone, I mean, is it advisable that someone calculates their own homes or should we, like someone going to an accountant, like pre present everything to mm -hmm. a more knowledgeable person and they calculate it for us? No, I think this is a personal duty and I think most people would be able to handle it themselves. Right. It is actually, it's not like, you know, uh, the revenue agency coming and asking you, you know, did you fill the <laughs> tax yeah. form or not? <laughs> you know, or we'll come and audit your accounts. Nobody's there. This is between me and God. Right. You know, I have to be sure that I have fulfilled my uh, duty. And so I think every Muslim should do that, and it's not that difficult. The main thing is that uh, we have to fix one day in our calendar mm -hmm. as the day of Homs, calculation of it. Right. We, without that, it's not going to work. So just like people have, you know, a fixed day in their calendar for their tax return. Yeah. Similarly, uh, whether it's in the middle of the year of the, or end of the year, you have the option. It doesn't even have to be the Islamic calendar or Muslim calendar. You can even pick any uh, date from the common calendar. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, then it's easy. You see, okay, a year has passed. Uh, whatever I've earned, uh, I have been spending it for myself and my dependents. Um, now, what was left on that day, that is where we have to look at the okay. accounts. Whatever I have saved or whatever profit I have made that year, from that I will take out uh, the 20%. Mm -hmm. There yeah. was also um, uh, another question that, that, that I had, um, which is that we, if we're living under another state, so Homs, I mean, should Homs be, is it part of um, living under Islamic rulership? Or, you know, if we're living in non-Muslim countries, mm -hmm. um, we are already paying money for the welfare system, and that is going to everybody as well. Mm -hmm. It's going to Muslims and non-Muslims and Shias and Christians. And, so should, could, could that tax be considered as khums? Yes, or? Khums. Uh, no, I'll borrow the, the words from, uh, from Prophet Isa. Uh, give to Caesar what is his, right. God give to the Lord what is his. Yeah. You know, uh, these are two different systems. Even the way we calculate, you know, like in the secular state that we live in, it is income tax. Yeah. Homs is not even income tax. It is actually, if you don't save anything, there is no homs wajib on, on you. Right. So two completely different systems. And f especially from the Shi'i point of view, we can see that uh, only Imam Ali 
became the ruler in his time, you know, five, yeah. last five years of his life, none of the other Imams after him became ruler of, or the head of the state. Still, the system of Khums was there. And it was being paid under the supervision or to the Imam directly. Yeah. Even though the Shias were still obliged by the state of the time to pay their zakat or other kinds of tax to the state. Yeah. So even in the presence of the Imams, we see that there were two parallel systems going on. Mm. And so that shouldn't be different even now. That yes, we have the governments and uh, many governments take care of the welfare system and we appreciate that mm. and we contribute to that. But that payment of tax also is a legitimate expense. Okay. So you're not paying homes from that. Means the way we spend the money for food and drink and transportation and accommodation, even payment of tax is part of it. Uh, so after we have paid the, uh, st uh, the tax to the secular state, then if something is left, then we have to pay homes out of mm -hmm. it. Thank you. That, that's probably, that's, that's yeah. clarified uh, things very usefully, yeah. I think, probably for, for, for many people watching. Um, and looking back in history, um, after the occultation of the Imam of our time, may Allah hasten his reappearance, uh, there was a practice among, among some followers of Ahl Bayt of, of burying their khums. So they said, now our legitimate leader has, has gone into occultation and he will be the one to, to distribute the khums when he reappears. So we'll, we will bury it, we'll store it until he reappears. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this practice is still continuing or legitimate or uh, whether no, that was a misunderstanding I, I, on their part. Yes, I think it's, it's a good question you raised because there are some people in the community uh, who I would say they're confused and they're creating more confusion by saying that, you know, in the early days this was the opinion and therefore, you know, this whole system of paying homes du during our time uh, you know, it's not the norm. Well, we realize that that was a opinion, an opinion at that time. Yeah. Um, for example, those who call themselves Akhbari. Yeah. And I would actually call them pseudo Akhbaris because they, I don't think they are true Akhbaris in that sense. Yeah. Um, they go with that. Uh, what I would say is that look at the example of Sheikh Saduq. He would probably be categorized by them as an Akhbari, although we don't think he is Akhbari in that technical sense, okay. as opposed to Usuli. Uh, and Sheikh Saduq was one of those who, you know, believed in that um, idea that what do you do in the ghaybat? Yeah. You take out the homes and then bury it. Or there was another opinion that, okay, you give it to your heir or write it in the will that this amount is the homes and if the imam appears in your lifetime, you hand it over to him and otherwise make a will also for next generation. Right. Now, what I would say is that this whole, uh, you know, th the variation in the opinion during the early days of Ghaybat at least proves the common issue that even in Ghaybat we have to calculate and take out khums. True, yes. Whether you're Akhbari or Rasul, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. So at least that much is common. Now the question comes up, now that you calculate the khums and you know this is the amount, what do you do with it? This opinion that you bury it, or you put it in your will for your next generation, and for them also advise that if they don't, if an imam doesn't appear, then continue in the generation after that, there is no basis for it. There is no hadith mm. which says that you have to do this. So we'll take one part to be the common law, which has been coming in the Shi'i fiqh even till now. We will, in a way, leave aside the second part of how to disperse yeah, that. Yeah. And this is where the our Shia Fuqaha of these days, uh, basically they say that once you have the khums, burying it, you know, if 
For example, the people in the days of Sheikh Sadduq had buried it. Now it would be True. gone. Yeah. You know, or even to say that for centuries people should have willed that this will can go on, on from one generation to another. The money is sitting there. First of all, it will not even last that no. long. And there will be no purpose in that. So our fuqaha basically say that we know the amount. This is the amount. We know who is the owner. Yeah. But we don't have access to him because he's in, in the occultation. So how do we en handle that uh, property? Uh, and that's where we, s we have the system of the niyabat, where the mushtahid and the fuqaha, they become naib of imam. Right. And so under their supervision, that um, wealth is being now used um, for the causes that they believe would be pleasing to the Imam of the time, mm -hmm. Ajalallah Ta'ala Farah Sharif. Okay, thank you very much. Very yeah. interesting um, overview of history and um, and all the different angles that are a part of this a part of this discussion. Um, I mean, a again, you've talked about the the distribution, and this is obviously most people's main concern about about the distribution that it goes to the right person um, and people feel especially nowadays you don't quite know um, you know what's going to happen to it especially as we're living um, very far apart so you can't easily trace mm. um, what has happened is it is it the responsibility of the person paying the homes to ensure that it's going to somewhere where it's going to be distributed in the right way or uh, is it the responsibility of the office or the person to whom they pay that khums to take that responsibility? So we would say, well, they say they're taking responsibility um, and we take their word for it and so we'll give our khums and then it's up to this person. Mm -hmm. Or should we investigate that person and find out how are they spending it, what are they doing with it and take that responsibility for, our, for ourselves? Well, l let me respond in two parts. One would be that in any system, there is always the possibility that things will not always work 100 yeah. percent in an ideal you know, way. Means even when we look at the days of the Imams, where the system of Vikalat was there, for example, the days of the seventh Imam, eighth Imam, and this is where later on you come to the Ghaybate. Sughra, the minor occultation, that's where you will see that the network of wikalat, yeah. those were agents of the Imam, had ex expanded. And even there we see the stories of some of the individuals who were appointed by the Imams, later on betraying the trust, you know, made yeah. on them. And so this is a possibility, you know, people sometimes are okay, sometimes, you know, greed comes in, shaitan comes in. And if that happened during the presence of the Imam, you can not say that in the ghaybat it wouldn't happen. Mm. But that should not, you know, that cannot be an excuse that, oh, because there is doubt, so I'll not pay home. So it's just like saying to the secular governments yeah. that you are, misusing the funds or not using it in the way it should be, is therefore I refuse to pay a tax. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. You, you can go and object to that and why the way it's being used, protest about it. And so in our system also, you know, I individuals, when, when it comes to how the homes is to be distributed, an individual has the duty to make sure it is given to either their marja, or those agents of the maraje or the institutions, mm -hmm. even in your own local area, who have been authorized to collect and use uh, that fund of homes in its right uh, purpose. Right. So you have to basically go and find out. Once you have given it to somebody who is authorized or to the maraje himself, your responsibility is over. If it's not even used in, in, in the right way, at least you will not be accountable in the eyes okay. of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will be accountable for it. Okay. And so that's the first thing. The second thing that, yes, we hear quite a lot these days, stories about, you know, oh, 
uh, so and so or such group uh, or such office you know they don't spend it in the right way I cannot believe that people cannot find an institution or a wakil of a marja or someone whom he, they can trust. Yeah. I don't think our community has reached to a point that there is no trustworthy yeah. you know, agency for that. Yeah. If you don't trust person A or institution A, go and find somebody else. But that should not become an excuse that I will not pay home. Hmm. You have to go and find out and, may, and you know, have trust in the, or build that trust after looking at the accounts and the details and the activities of the, some of the organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you have that confidence level, that's where you should go and pay. And, and, and also it has been said that um, people can um, pay it to charity, a charity of their choice, um, or some charities also have the permission, the ijaza, to yeah, the, 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 the charities, uh, charitable organizations who have the permission, uh, that would be one best way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, so you can then go and look at, review their activities, their you know, annual reports, and that's where you will see how it's being used. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, so there was there was going to have a question about how do we calculate the the homes um, which we've had before because sometimes doing our own accounts is, is, is not I mean I've got very simple accounts but some people have quite complex uh, accounts um, but I mean again you've said it's a trust between but, but I suppose there's no harm in, in calculating it if we wanted to um, go through the accounts and oh, then yes, s yes, expenditure yes. tax and then I means if, if somebody really has a an ordinary individual I don't think they worry about it that much but those were businesses and this and yeah. that uh, they probably would need to let their accountant know about the system of homes so they can do the calculations yeah. for them and help them out in this in this way mm -hmm. yeah. And also that might be a good way of, um, of course, dawa or at least letting people know about Islam, that there yes. is this system that um, we're, people, are, people are using as well. Um, going, I mean, going to the, to the responsibility in the family um, on, on who pays khums now, uh, you know, we're living in an age where often the husband and the wife are mm. working, um, or the you know, everyone in the house is working because now everybody has to mm. has to work to try to to, to contribute. Um, so looking at you know a family where, for example, the husband and the wife are earning, and maybe one of the siblings is earning, who then becomes responsible for for paying the homes? How and how's that calculated? Well, in in case of a couple, husband and wife. Uh, you know, if they have everything joined, the accounts and the money comes in the same place, and that's how they spend it f to maintain their own life, then it would be easy. Yeah. You don't have to have a separate, you know, accounting for homes, because everything is going in the same place. And right. then at the end, you see if there is any saving done collectively, that's where you will do the calculation mm -hmm. of homes. But if you keep separate accounts, both individual, the husband and wife, are keeping it separate, then they will have to deal with it separately. The husband will have to look at his own, you mm -hmm. know, accounts. The wife will have to do, and maybe if a working child has to do the mm -hmm. same thing. So it all depends on how, how is their lifestyle. And do they pay, because um, obviously we know, um, you know, there are rules in Islam such as um, a woman is entitled to keep her earnings, she doesn't have to declare it to her husband, um, and the husband is meant to have certain financial responsibilities in the home. Obviously, this doesn't always work out in this exact pattern, but um, should she, is, is she liable, the wife liable to pay the same amount as the husband, even though, say, her responsibilities, financial responsibilities, might be less, or is it dependent on the person's financial responsibilities? Well, the, the, the amount of homes will change. Mm. Yes, if you look at, let's say, husband and wife both working, and the wife keeps her own earnings, 
whereas the husband is working and he has to provide for himself and his wife and the and the family. Yeah. So, depending on how much they, they are earning, you know, the husband's uh, saving will be less because he's spending. He's the one who is providing yeah. for the whole family, whereas the wife is not sharing in the expenditure of the family. So she will be probably accumulating more savings. Yeah. So maybe she will end up paying more homes. Uh -huh. So it all depends on, on how they manage their finances. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, also um, you, you talked about um, the, the, this, this uh, mixed, uh, the, the, the issue of mixed uh, wealth mm -hmm. and that um, you have said that, um, well, legitimate and illegitimate wealth. You said that, although you said that for so someone, someone might reform, for example, they might have been a gambler and they've come back to Islam, and, but, but um, they might want to purify their wealth. Um, but you have said that anything that has been acquired by means not permitted in Sharia, such as usury gambling or liquor, um, is... Um, is not permissible to use? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something acquired by means which are not legitimate from the Sharia point of mm. view. Uh, would not you be, will not become your property mm -hmm. because it was acquired through un, unlawful means. Yeah. And so, as I said earlier, that if there is an item or a figure known that this is belongs to so and so or it was acquired from such a uh, you know entity or a person through legitimate means and if it's possible to give it back yeah. to that entity or that person you have to pay, give mm -hmm. it back but if that is not possible or even separating what is legit from what mm -hmm. what is uh, illegitimate um, is all mixed up mm -hmm. then one way would be to purifying it so by giving homes out of the total. Mm -hmm. I mean, if someone had, uh, had, I mean, and this is a phenomenon we see very much in, in, in the West, is Muslims who have a supermarket that, you know, behind the desk is like a wall of alcohol, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so supposing, you know, someone had, they had a supermarket and they used to sell alcohol, um, and uh, should, they, should they attempt to return the earnings from that alcohol back to the companies that they, <laughs> or that's no, a bit too stringent. It's, practically, it wouldn't work yeah. because he's to selling it to customers. Yeah. Where I don't think any, you know, uh, owner of the shop would be able to go after all the. Yeah, the no, customers. that's true. That's <laughs> true. I'm trying to think of a way of, of where someone, or for example, gambling. Like, for example, now in the UK, this started 20 years ago, um, um, the lottery, you know, you pay some money and you fill out some numbers and you hope to win something. And this is a very good tax on the yeah, poor that yeah. was invented in this country. Uh, or something else that's something that is, like, let's say, identifiable, but not, not a person. So if someone went to, went, liked to go gambling um, and they managed to get some money through gambling, um, but they, you know, at least some of the, the some of what they have gained through gambling is identifiable. Say a few thousand pounds, mm. and they stored it, and then they have a kind of they go back to Islam. Should they go back to the gambling house and return that to the gambling house? That that would be. Uh you're returning it back to people who are, but who yeah, who, who are going to promote that evil anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that I wouldn't be able to give it, give you a definitive answer right. to that. But I would say that probably in that case, no, you shouldn't be giving it back because you are then ending up promoting yeah. uh, an activity which is forbidden in Islam. Yeah. Um, it will be more, you know, applicable to a situation where a person was working in a company. Yeah. Um, he somehow had the means of getting some money, you know, transferred to himself. Like fraud, for example. By fraud, yeah. Later on, you know, he feels he has this 
guilty conscious and he realizes this is wrong and he knows the amount. In that case, you know the company where you worked and you know the amount. Yeah. That's where you go and give back. But even there, there, there would be situations. If, if you're still working there and if you go and give, you know, it might have an impact <laughs> on your continuity of your employment. Yeah. So then you have to find some other anonymous ways yeah. of giving it back. Right. So you don't have to necessarily go and declare right. that it was me who did it. Right. Okay, so, but at least you would have fulfilled your duty of uh, putting, putting you know, right the situation mm -hmm. which was wrong before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and again, thinking about how, how Holmes is, is, is distributed, it seems to be, again, from a layman's person like myself, it seems to be quite a mysterious process of how Holmes is, is distributed. Um, is it, is it um, distributed according to, you know, very strictly according to the, the categories that you've yeah. outlined? I mean, is it more difficult to distribute it? Because we're not, we're not living under an Islamic polity or, you know, it, everyone is very scattered now. Yes. Um, and, and I don't know how it's transferred. Or well, it's, it's, you know, if you look at the, uh, the people who live in North America or Europe, yeah. um, there are two kinds of manifestation of how the homes is used. For example, if you look at many of the religious institutions in the West, and many of the religious activities going on, uh, Homs has is a significant part of that, if not a major part. Yeah. It's not unfortunately announced or identified, and that's why people don't know about it. Yeah. You know, you can have centers bid for fifteen million dollars. Maybe five million of that was from Homs. Okay. And so I think one of the problems is that the, uh, the institutions do not recognize this uh, for the people to know about it. Mm. Because that kind of disclosure would be really helpful in letting people know that, okay, we have something visibly that yes, we can see yes. that Holmes played a part yeah. in there. And then, uh, when it comes to the, of course, the, the emphasis that our uh, Maraja would have is that it's not the buildings, it is more the people whom you should be serving. Yeah. So many of the activities is actually sponsored, uh, you know, partially by homes. And especially when it comes to the poor and, in, and, and the needy, it's more used in Places like Iraq, for example, yeah. or Afghanistan, or you know, areas in Pakistan and in India or Africa, mm. and so people who are here don't really see that unless they read reports yeah. of some of the charity organization who do the charity work over there. Mm. Uh, and so this is where I think you know we go back to this issue that be familiar with the organizations in your own local area, see who is doing what. And that is where you will get this confidence mm. in how these uh, charity money is being used. Yeah. Because the main purpose of Homs would be Sahim al Imam, especially, yeah. uh, is to relieve the poor and the needy Shia individuals, wherever they are, um, to maintain the religious institutions uh, for propagation of the faith. Okay. Uh, which also includes whether it is the Hausa or Islamic studies you know, institutions or even the scholars who are working and promoting Islam, they have to be uh, somehow be supported. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because we can't expect them to work, uh, you know, full time somewhere else and then come. Yeah, which is uh, a problem sometimes yes, as well. Yes, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. If you want somebody to dedicate their full time and attention on it, then they have to be supported and yeah. Sahim al Imam will become one of the means of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, in, in many cases you will see that our religious uh, institutions, even to the level of Marjayat, um, are independent of government sources. Mm. They don't rely and they don't accept it because they, want, they, they don't want to be influenced. Yeah. 
in any way. Or beholden or... Yes, yeah. yes. And so this is where even the independence of our marja'iyat depends on the homes. It doesn't mean that when there is no homes because, you know, economic situation of the community has not always been the yeah, same. Yeah. There would be a time when people are not able to pay homes that much. Uh, so their independence doesn't depend on it, but this is one way mm -hmm. where they don't worry about any other source of support. Thank you very much. That was, that was an excellent discussion, mm -hmm. Said Rizvi, and uh, very useful and helpful, inshallah, for, for, for our viewers and for myself as well. So I wanted to thank you for your time. You're welcome. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our service mm -hmm. and, you know, give us tawfiq to understand Islam in a better way, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much and we wish you a safe journey back to Canada as well. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching the program. I hope that was as useful for you as it was for me. Inshallah, we'll see you again. Asalaamu Alaikum.